Wonderful. Well, hello, everybody. It's weird not being able to see you all, um, but I hope that everyone is well and you are enjoying yourselves this evening, um, getting together um, as my talk is titled, Tis the Season to be Social. And it's about time. <laughs> We've had quite a while where it was a weird way. Of, this was our only way to be socialists. And so I apologize for not being there in person. Um, things just got kind of busy towards the end of the semester as usual. So I'm going to jump right in um, and talk to you about one of my favorite topics, which um, is sociality, and also kind of explain sociality through the lens of entomology or insects. So sociality, and it comes from socialis in Latin, literally means to associate. It's a zoological term, and it refers to organisms living together and also breeding in an organized community. And we'll go through different examples of this. Um, but we see in insect biology, as well as insect physiology, there's some unique social insect organi organizational structures, which we'll talk about. And also we'll compare that to some other kind of interactions within the animal kingdom. Um, and I do want to say that sociality is something that's long been very much of an interest to us as humans because we see how well these social organisms function, especially in regards to insects like termites and honeybees and even wasp species. So we see the efficiency and the um, ability to survive and work together, and that's something that is pretty special um, and that many different types of government have even tried to, um, you know, replicate within their constructs. So one thing that I try to stress and is thinking of you sociality or social behavior actually as a continuum. Um, not all organisms are that social, honestly. And the reason I like to use insects is because we see the full spectrum in the insect world from solitary insects that are not social at all um, to insects that may group together, but they don't necessarily socialize or breed together in an organized structure um, to some that specifically come together for particular reasons, um, like in communal and subsocial insects, as well as some insects that we see parental care, where they actually invest time and energy beyond just kind of laying them on a suitable plant um, to their offspring, to the very other side of this uh, uh, continuum, which is social insects, where individuals of the same species are highly organized in a cooperative manner. And just my only non-insect example I'm going to really talk about tonight are the naked mole rats. Um, naked mole rats are really interesting. And when we talk about the three kind of characteristics that truly define a eusocial organism, I'll get back to why I'm kind of fascinated by naked mole rats, besides the fact that they're just so freaky looking. <laughs> All right, so we can give thanks to Charles Michener and um, his crazy quagmire of <laughs> insect behavioral classification. Um, but, you know, I got to give him props because he was just trying to figure this out on his own, trying to come up with a classification of insect behavior. And although some of these caveats within this classification behavior are blurry and there's gray areas, he did a pretty darn good job. Um, and his classification starts with solitary insects, um, then goes to a communal type of behavior, to quasi-social, to semi-social, to eusocial. So what does this mean? What are the differences between these? Why do we care? Well, I'm going to walk through each of these using insect examples. So solitary insects um, are non-social, and all of these pictures here represent pictures of solitary insects. Now, you'll see that with the praying mantis, this hunts alone, it, you know, the only time it really gets together with another of its kind is for mating purposes. 
And even then, if you're a male, you'll probably get your head ripped off after you mate. Um, so very kind of solitary life cycle, only together for breeding purposes. Now, the ladybugs that we see, they, you can see, are all together, but they're not organized. They're not structurally organized. They're only together or aggregating to mate or to share some type of resource. It might be water. It might be shelter. It might be food. Um, the same goes with the mayflies, which are represented in the bottom circle, where they just synchronously emerge at the same time, and they have evolved this way to emerge at the same time, this synchronous emergence, in order to secure a mate because they only live for such a short amount of time as an adult. So we can safely say that most insects actually are solitary. They interact with others only during birth if eggs laid in large masses, and this is really to find food. So if you've ever seen a bunch of eggs emerge, of course, they're going to be together, but then they'll disperse quickly. Then they'll interact again later during mating, but they'll eat, they'll grow, and they'll lay their eggs alone. It's kind of sad when we think about it. <laughs> but aggregations, like I said, they're not truly sociality, though when you see a group of insects, you might think there's some type of community structure. Oftentimes, this is just passive interaction. Egg masses grouped on a good food source or for mating, feeding, or overwintering purposes. Now, the next grouping within this behavioral continuum are communal insects. And now we're going to get into some of the lingo that we associate with this um, description of social behavior. And with communal insects, we see that members of the same generation live together in the same nest. Now we can see this with andrenids, that is a type of mining bee. We can also see this with some polyctids, which are sweat bees, not all species, but some. Now communal insects, they may the same generation may live together in the same nest, but there isn't cooperative brood care. So oftentimes there'll be multiple reproductive females and they'll be caring for their young and the other reproductive female will be caring for their young, but they're just sharing the same nest space, okay? Um, so there's no cooperative brood care. Everyone goes about their own business. So this is something that's common in some of these ground nesting bees. So we wouldn't even say that they're necessary, necessarily solitary because they do share some of these nesting sites, but there's no communication or interaction here. Another example would be tent caterpillars. I'm sure many of you have seen eastern tent caterpillars or fall armyworm, um, and they build these tents literally out of silk, but it provides shelter when they're not feeding. Otherwise, there's no parental care provided, there's no communication, it's just they're sharing that sheltered space. Now the next grouping is quasi-social, and I think this is a really cool one. And this is where we see parental care um, for immatures. So there's actual parenting after the babies emerge from their insect eggs, at least for part of their life cycle. Up here, we see this cockroach that they're guarding and protecting their babies once they're hatched. And we see this with many species of cockroaches actually, where they'll guard the eggs and then they'll guard the really early instars, which are these little tiny baby nymphs until they are larger and more sclerotized or their exoskeleton hardens and they can protect themselves. Another example of this quasi-social behavior is seen in this giant water bug down here. And this is actually a male this is the daddy, and the mother actually lays her eggs on the daddy. Um, this basically makes him care for those eggs. So she kind of goes off, does her own thing. They probably never see each other again, but that daddy is going to aerate those eggs, going to come up out of the water to provide them oxygen, as well as guard them until they hatch off of his, off of his back. The good daddy. So semi-social, um, again, we're going to look into some of this uh, social lingo, cooperative brood care. So now we see members of the same generation living together, like we saw in the communal, 
um, and, and subsocial, but now we also have cooperative brood care. So members of the same generation, so we have multiple reproductives um, living in this and in, in sharing a nest space, but now there's some interaction between the, the workers taking care of, of multiple reproductives, reproductives um, babies. So they're cooperating to take care of multiple queens offspring. Sometimes there's reproductive division of labor. Um, so that means there could be some um, reproductives that are morphologically different and specifically genetically or uh, trophallactically designated as um, the, the particular reproductive member of the, that particular nest, um, but not all the time, it's, it's variable. And helictids are probably one of the best groups to showcase this semi-social behavior. There's a wide range of sociality within the group. You probably could find sweat bees, which is helictids, it's a family name for this group, um, that could occupy most of the different um, subsections of, of uh, behavior in insects. All right, so now to where we'll spend the rest of our time. And this is the very end of the continuum and talking about eusocial organisms or insects, in this case, that are truly social. So eusocial and true sociality are the same thing. Um, and Hymenoptera, which is an order classification um, that contains bees, wasps, and ants, and the order Blatidea, which contains termites and, and, co and cockroaches, are the only two insect orders that exhibit true sociality or have you social behavior. And it's interesting, some bees and some wasps are considered truly social, and but all ants, all of the ant species out there, there's not one that is solitary. Now, if we look at the order Blatidea, it's kind of similar in that all termites are considered eusocial. However, some and only some cockroaches are actually considered social. So now let's look at the characteristics of truly social insects. Now, there's overlap of generations. Now, remember with these other kind of caveats, we talked about the same generation living together. Now we have overlap of generations. So there's um, multiple generations living in the same nest. The next characteristic is reproductive division of labor. And I'm not just talking about um, different types of tasks for workers. I'm talking about there's an isolated reproductive that's morphologically different designed, designated to do all of the reproducing, right? So in this case, some individuals are gonna forego reproduction. And in the case of Hymenoptera, which can't, contains bees, wasps, and ants, any eusocial organisms in Hymenoptera, their workers are sterile. Okay, so cooperative rearing of young is the other one. So now these three characteristics must be present in order for an organism or community of organisms to be considered eusocial. And this is such a great depiction of termites. This is a particular species of Nazut termite. You can see these are, um, well, let me see if I can do the pointer. This is the little um, worker here, or the soldier, excuse me, here. And you can see its head is highly sclerotized and shaped into this cone where it can secrete different defensive compounds to protect the nest and its inhabitants. These ones here that have these kind of shortened mandibles are the workers. Hey, Debbie? Yeah. We, uh, we, we can't see what you're uh, pointing out. Oh. Yeah, now? you have to. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, there we go. You see now. <laughs> oh, thank you. So this right here is the Nazut um, soldier. And you can see that kind of cone-shaped head. And it squirts out different defensive compounds depending on the species to protect the nest inhabitants. These right here, these are all workers, sterile workers that are going to be taking care of this crazy, large, reproductively fecund queen termite. And what's crazy about these termites is this queen um, actually was just a little bit bigger than the worker before she was mated. 
Um, and this right here, these stripes, these are actually the exoskeleton, the hard part of her body, um, which you can see them represented here on these workers. And in between is the membranous region that's just enlarged once she became mated. There was this physiological shift to her becoming this egg laying machine, which is disgustingly crazy. All right, so you social insects, we have cooperative brood care, which we can see here. We know as we are beekeepers, we see this cooperative brood care all the time. And thank goodness for it, because there's lots of little mouths that need to be fed. Um, also, the reproductive di division of labor, where we have this large queen that she is morphologically designed to be the sole reproductive in the colony. We also have this overlapping of generations where we have perennial colonies, right? Um, and we can further break down new social insects even into more nuanced groups where we can have primitively eusocial social groups like bumblebees and certain wasps. Um, and we can also have advanced eusociality like we see in the honeybees, the ants and termites where we have these perennial nests. So we can even kind of um, define these a little bit it more specifically as to whether they're annual or perennial. In the primitively eusocial, they're not perennial in the sense that the whole nest survives, but their reproductive survives. And so that's what continues on this kind of very social um, uh, organism and population. So there's other cool characteristics of eusocial insects, and we're going to get into some of them, and we're going to talk about some really crazy um, examples, mostly with ants, because, you know, a lot of people fear honeybees and or fear wasps and things that sting in, in that nature. But I can tell you after being um, traveling in the tropics that I fear ants. Um, it's amazing the things that they can do um, and how large their colonies are. But the first characteristic that is often associated with other eusocial organisms is trophallaxis. And we've seen this many times, this ritual feeding between colony members. And trophallaxis is not only kind of regurgitating resources amongst the colony, but we know that through trophallaxis, they're also spreading pheromones. Um, so they're communicating. We also know that they are inoculating other members with different types of bacteria and yeast that might be beneficial for digesting and in their gut. Um, so this ritual feeding, this trophallaxis is something that has evolved within you social organisms because they closely live together. Another thing that we see with you social organisms are complex chemical communication. Um, honeybees are a great example, but we see this in ants. We also see this in termites. Um, these are just two examples here. We know this characteristic kind of scenting behavior in honeybees where they are lifting up their abdomen, releasing the Nazanov pheromone in order to orient and, and as a homing pheromone for other workers who are, might be out foraging, or maybe it might be a queen or a, um, hope, a hopeful queen to return from a mating flight. Um, we also, of course, know about the, the retinue um, and the queen substance that she exudes that causes a whole host of different um, types of responses in the workers and the members of the colony. Another characteristic in new social organisms, and again, I'm using honeybee examples here, but this is also true with ants and termites. And I would say that termites are even more amazing, um, at least some species in the architecture and the sheer um, ventilation systems that they can create in, these, in their nests. Um, but in eusocial organisms, their nests are very much controlled in terms of temperature and humidity um, and also ventilation because stagnant air, different types of, if there isn't proper airflow, they can very quickly um, suffocate and die. Um, but we know this as beekeepers, we worry every winter when our bees are going through these cold temperatures, if they're going to have a big enough cluster in order to thermoregulate. We also see this bearding behavior in the summertime, um, knowing that they're trying to cool down their colony. 
So this is also associated with eusocial organisms. And probably one of my favorite ones, and I love when I'm talking to students at UD about social insects, is swarming. And this is reproduction at the colony level. Again, I'm giving a honeybee example here. Um, but we know that it's normal for these eusocial organisms, it's, it's successful for them to grow in size. And when they get large enough, we know that they swarm. Right. Um, this parental colony, the old queen and part of that colony will leave and they will very generally and simplistically. Um, there's a lot of complication, complicated stuff going on here, but for the sake of this talk, they will find a new place to live and they'll leave behind a virgin um, and the rest of the colony. Um, so in essence, they are becoming from one, they become two. So this is reproduction at the colony level. We see this in honeybees, we see this in termites, and we see this in ants. Um, I always ask my students, how many of you have ever seen a bunch of winged ants at one time? You're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? That's what ants do. They, the reproductives, and this is for termites as well, um, certain point in their life cycle, they will become winged. We call these alates, and they will take off in these massive winged swarms and hopefully fly away from their colony, meet up with another um, male, and then they will settle down, their wings will drop off, and they'll start a new colony. Um, so this is something that's unique to eusocial insects, this reproduction at the colony level. All right, so you would think, gosh, so many of these eusocial insects have such large populations. Um, this must be common, but actually it's extremely rare. Only about 2% of insect species are eusocial. And if we think about finding true sociality in other parts of the animal kingdom, it's not real easy. Um, and I talked about the naked mole rats before, and for a long time, they couldn't find a mammal that had all of the characteristics that is nor that are normally associate that they normally associate with truly social organisms. Um, but recently, um, they actually found that the sole reproductive in the naked mole, ma uh, mole rat colony actually has a longer vertebrate. So she is morphologically distinct and genetically designed to be the sole reproductive. So that allowed this kind of organism to be considered truly social, which is pretty cool. As rare as it is, they do account for about 75% of the total insect biomass. And that is very obvious when you're in the tropics. Um, and that's why I, I fear ants. Um, because they, I think, could take me away if I was left alone for too long. Um, now, reproductive division of labor, like I said, is something that is extremely important to this idea of eusociality. And we'll discuss why um, mainly using honeybees or hymenoptera as our example. But this reproductive division of labor is super significant because it so goes against the idea of fitness, um, right? So in this case, some individuals in the colony actually forego reproducing, right? In order to raise the offspring of others, which is so not kind of what you would think of as normal biological success. <laughs> and so we have these sterile female workers um, and who actually help to raise um, other sterile female workers and eventually, and in some cases, a new queen. Um, and so much so that the queen actually can communicate in ways to help suppress um, worker ovary development. And so this is really interesting. If you look across ants, you look across um, termites, you look across any of these eusocial organisms, this reproductive division of labor not only um, it's, it's a morphological piece to it as well, which I think is really, really interesting. 
All right, so I have to give props to Charles Darwin when I'm talking about eusociality as well as um, honeybees in a way. Um, he is quoted to say, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And I can tell you that eusocial organisms, eusocial insect societies, are because of the diversity within are extremely responsive to change. And so we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about why social insects perplexed Darwin so much. It actually was the reason the origin of the species was delayed in publication. Um, it was delayed for two decades because he couldn't wrap his head around why these sterile workers would forego reproduction. How did that evolve? It didn't make any sense to him based on his idea of natural selection. All right, so Darwin's dilemma. So this behaviors of sterile worker insects challenged his theory. And so if we look at some of these different jobs that sterile workers perform, like comb building, like feeding the young, um, foraging, all of these things. It didn't make any sense to him in regards to kind of this idea of natural section that that, that would be selected for for the for the work for these sterile workers. If we look more and specifically at the conundrum, how do sterile casts traits, so the traits of the workers evolve or get passed to the next generation? Right. So these traits that we see in workers, if the workers aren't reproducing, how are they getting passed on to the next generation? This was another conundrum that Darwin um, was you know, pondering. It is against an individual self-interest to give up reproductive potential. So what does that mean and why do we care? Well, it brings up this idea of kin selection and the evolution of eusociality. And it also brings up the idea of altruism. And that is kind of this idea of taking care take, and, and having somebody else's life worth more than, say, your own. And this all gets back to relatedness. So kin selection is actually defined or refers to apparent strategies in evolution that factor the or excuse me, favor the reproductive success of an organism's relatives, even at a cost to their own survival or reproduction. So we've already talked about that, right? And we know that workers, they've given up their reproductive success to raise the queen's offspring. Now, the idea here of kin selection and the evolution of eusociality is that sisters are more related to each other than they are to their own mother or father. And this is due to their sex determination system or the fact that all hymenopterans, ants, bees, and wasps are haplodiploid. And I don't even care, it, it, haplodiploidy, sex determination, whatever. The key here is that the sisters are more related to each other than they are to the queen or a drone daddy, all right? So let's look at this in more detail. If we look at a queen, Right. We know this and we know this because we're good beekeepers. We know that if we have a queen in there and all we see are drones in our colony, the colony's gone droney. We know she's somehow not able to fertilize the eggs because all we're getting are males. Right. We're getting a bunch of drones because they're haploid. And so this haploid diploid, it just refers to whether she's fertilized the egg, which would result in a diploid, which would result in a worker or that she didn't fertilize the egg right? Because she has that sperm storage organ where she can make that choice to do one or the other. Now, what's interesting here, and another thing to know, is that the fertilized egg, a diploid, will become a female offspring. So it can be a worker or a queen. And this goes into this whole relatedness idea as well. So let's break it down a little bit more. So if we look here at the queen and the male, and then we look here at worker to worker to queen produced male, <clears throat> you can see here the relative, this R equals relatedness value, right? And so these workers are very closely related, hyper related. I would say super sisters. Whereas you can see here, the queen 
is only about 0.5 relatedness to the workers, but worker to worker is 0.75. Worker to drone is 0.25, right? So very interesting that we see this relatedness in the female offspring. So what's so important about this is that, of course, these females are going to forego their reproductive success or they've evolved to because they are helping the queen to raise offspring that they're more closely related to. And possibly when that colony is going to reproduce at the colony level, they're going to help to raise a queen that is more related and able to pass on their genes to a new colony. So what's really interesting, too, is that caste determination is determined through differential feeding, right? We know this. But it is that same female that's 0.7 5% related to these other workers that is going to carry on and become a queen, which will then start a new colony. Newly raised virgin queens will be 0.75% related to the workers and will carry those genes forward. So that's kind of cool and interesting. But there's been a lot of debate on how eusociality evolved. And even still, um, one of the biggest proponents for kin selection, if we go back, we can go back all the way to Richard Dawkins when we just talk about kind of genes and, and the selfishness of, of organisms trying to get their genes into the next generation, and then even move on um, to talk about E.O. Wilson's ideas um, behind uh, kin selection. Right. Um, but I will tell you that more recently, E.O. Wilson put out work that suggests this idea of group selection. Where selection actually favored or followed at the group level. Formation of a group, persistence and cohesion of the group. We see all of these kind of group level um, characteristics like defensible nest. And then once these kind of traits, these group level traits were beneficial, then it allowed these genes to, which we would maybe call you social genes, um, at the group level to be passed on at the group level. So spreading of other traits that favor a group. So in essence, natural selection acting on a group. Um, and there's a lot of debate to this. This is not something that everyone swallows. That's for dang sure. Um, so, but if we look at mechanisms of social organization and we look at how things may have evolved over time, taking other examples, social organization by social insects, we know how revered it was. If you look in old religious um, uh, papers or books, if you look at old kind of um, political uh, and laws and rules in other societies, they oftentimes refer to social insect societies, drones, busy as a bee. I'm sure many of you have, have heard of these and read about this. But in insect societies, we know no one is in charge. The queen isn't in charge. She's not telling the other members in the ant colony what to do. They're not telling the other members in the termite nest what to do. They're just laying eggs like mad, emitting certain pheromones to suppress things. But they're not telling foragers to go forage, right? What's happening in these eusocial organisms is a decentralized organization. It's a self-organization. And it's something that we can see in how patterns and sand dunes arise, how all the cells and bodies work together to make this fun fun functioning human whole, right? Where this global pattern of organization arises from the interactions of many, in this case, grains of sand in the... Oh. Um, multicellular organism, all the different cells of an individual who follow simple rules in response to local conditions and therefore this beautiful working complex pattern or organism can function. 
it's pretty awesome. So the benefits of sociality and why this is cool is that it allows for the utilization of large and more diverse resources. This picture up above here, let me get the little pointer thingy out. This is what would be considered the current range of Apis mellifera. Okay, over here, um, this is kind of a small range of Apis. This is Apis mellifera in the red. It's not the native range, but it's the range where they can and do exist now. And that's because of their ability to thermoregulate. All those characteristics I told you about, this is what's led to their crazy success, right? They can utilize more resources. They can defend themselves against predators as a group. They can exist as perennial long-lived superorganisms. And if you've never read The Superorganism by Bert Holdobler and E.O. Wilson, it's very interesting, especially if you're a beekeeper. Um, and that really kind of talks about how you social insect colonies are a single super organism. They intake resources, they dispose of waste, they defend themselves, they reproduce, and they control their environment as a social colony, as a super organism. Many individuals coming together to solve social ecological problems, but together as a colony of thousands of individuals, which is so super cool. We study the coolest group, don't we? I'm sure you're all like, yes, yes, we do. Well, now I want to talk about ants because ants are crazy. They're extremely numerous, not only in species, but also in abundance. So there's thousands of species of ants, but you don't just have like one or two ants in a colony. You have a lot of ants. OK, usually if you have one, there's many, many more where that came from. Ants also are holometabolists, just like honeybees, meaning that they go through true metamorphosis. They completely change from an immature to an adult. And they actually have a transition stage called a pupa, um, where they basically turn their immature state into a liquid soup to create this adult that looks nothing like the, the baby looked like, right? Um, so it's pretty miraculous. They're also haplodiploid, just like honeybees, and they have diverse casts. And I would say ants have won the award for diversity in casts, for sure, across Hymenoptera. They have perennial colonies, meaning they exist from season to season. And I want to begin by talking about Argentine ants. Um, this is a very interesting group. They're native to South America, and they're actually highly invasive. So they have, we have some here, not in, not where we live here, but we have some in North America, um, but they lack a stinger. So they don't necessarily present a threat to us in terms of hurting us, they are going to displace native ant species. And that's why they are a danger. They're an ecological threat. But Argentine ants are super unique because they display something known as unicoloniality. Say that a bunch of times, unicoloniality. And for those of you who might not know what that is, in a typical ant colony, one that doesn't exhibit unicoloniality, um, there'll be a single queen and her offspring. That makes simple kind of sense, right? There'll be a queen and a bunch of workers in a single nest. In ants that are unicolonial, they're composed of multiple nests and multiple queens, but they all recognize each other as the same nest. So this creates super colonies. So if you have one nest with a queen and workers, and over here you have another nest with queen and workers, and then maybe even in the next state you have another nest with workers and they're unicolonial, then they all will recognize each other as the same nest and not fight one another. There'll be no territoriality. So it can create literally super colonies, some of them the size 
and actually bigger than multiple states put together. It's crazy stuff. So if we look at these Argentine ant super colonies, right? This is the world distribution of Argentine ant. Here's the native range in green. Um, let me get the little pointer thingy in the green here. And here is introduced range of these super colonies, right? Um, so they're capable of forming these crazy large super colonies. Um, and they can very quickly inhabit and outcompete and move out other ants. The largest known super colony is actually in Europe and it stretches from the coast of Spain to Italy. So you can see it right here. This is all one colony. It's totaling a distance between 4,000 to 6,000 kilometers. And what's really interesting is this super colony here, if you were to kind of take bees from, or bees, ants from Spain and bring them close to the ones in Italy, there'd be no aggression. However, if you were to take some from Spain and then maybe even bring them to these ones closer up here, um, then there could be. There, so there's, there is aggression between super colonies, but not within. All right. Another crazy group are the honeypot ants. Honeypot ants are found in more arid areas of the world and talk about sacrifice <laughs> and giving up your reproductive, actually giving up pretty much everything for the colony. Um, this takes probably an award um, for this. And Justin, I think the next slide is a video. So if you want to press play. All righty. Well, I hope you enjoyed how amazing <laughs> the honeypots are. They're just so crazy. Anyway. All right, so another amazing example are army ants. And I don't have a cool video for you here, but if we look at these army ants that populate many tropical regions on this planet, they are called army ants because they don't have a permanent nest. They travel as true nomads in a bivouac, um, which is what you're seeing here. And this is our, this is made up of all the members of the colony. So they constantly are on the move. They're carrying their young. So this center line here are um, workers as well as soldiers um, that are carrying all the young and they're constantly carrying the young, moving on and acquiring more resources. These two ants that you're seeing here are members of the same colony. So this is how extraordinary the morphological differences can be kind of distinguishing the castes. Obviously, this large um, uh, ant here is the soldier. Definitely would not want to mess with that. Um, and this ant here is a worker. Um, so really just beautiful, you know, demonstration of these differences in morphological castes in this nomadic social colony. All right, so we don't have a whole lot of time, um, but I you, you'll have a copy of this video and I definitely recommend you watching this next video here on your own time. This is about kidnapper ants. And I'll just give you the quick gist. Um, these kidnapper ants, um, you can see this is a worker here. These are the mandibles and they're pretty smooth. Um, there's, they're kind of have really small serrations, but they're not strong enough to break down food in order to be able to eat it. So what they do is they find and scout out other ant species, and then they'll go in and raid their nests and capture their young. So these are larvae and pupae that are not adults yet. They'll bring them into their nest and they will coat them in um, different types of secretions that make them smell and think they're part of their colony. Now, the reason they do this is because the ants they're kidnapping have special mandibles for um, breaking down and chewing food. So essentially, they kidnap their young, they bring them to their nest, 
and then they raise them as their own, make them forage and do work for them. And then they will regurgitate the food into their mouths because they have no way of breaking down the food themselves. Crazy. How did this evolve? That's one, that's like one thing. What? Right? Crazy stuff. So two different ant species, one kind of literally using the other as slaves. Um, ant trafficking, right? That's what we could call it. All right. And then, of course, we know this beautiful example. And if you don't, again, just have a Google party about leafcutter ants. Ada, um, which is the genus. Oh, my gosh. They're absolutely amazing. Um, they're like the true cows of the rainforest. Boy, can they defoliate a tree and um, greenery very rapidly. Um, and that's because they use this plant material in order to farm their fun a fungus, um, which would not actually even exist if it wasn't throughout the ants. If they're actually, if they co-evolved with, with one another, the fungus and the ants, um, and they cannot live without each other. So the only place you'll find this fungus is in a leafcutter ant nest in these fungus gardens. Um, and they have special mandibles for being able to chew and cut these pieces of plant material, bring them down, they chew up the plant material, and then they regurgitate it into the fungal gardens where this fungus will start to, um, you know, germinate and these fruiting bodies will form and then they get the nutrients from eating the fungal fruiting bodies. It is truly miraculous. Um, but just to show you some of the amazing, amazing ways that these social colonies have been able to solve and come up with the most creative types of, of living situations. All right. So one of the last things I want to talk to you guys about are weaver ants. Um, and weaver ants, um, again, there's a video associated with this, but actually we're going to forego it. Hopefully you guys can watch it on your own time because I think weaver ants are the most interesting ant in the world. Um, they also are found in the tropics. And what you're seeing here is this festooning behavior, but they're festooning in order to build a domicile for them. Um, so they're building a nest structure, a house for their colony. And they do this through attaching onto one another and then pulling the plant material closer together. Now, if this wasn't extraordinary enough, um, they actually will take their young. So this worker ant is holding a larval stage worker ant. Um, and the larvae, larval stage have silk glands where they can produce silk. So what they do is they'll take the larvae and they weave these leaves together in order to create the secure, structural, structurally sound shelter for their colony. Now, sadly enough, these larvae, this is very costly metabolically. So these larvae are exhausted and will not have the energy and resources to um, go through development to become an adult, but they do care for the larvae until the larvae die that these larvae give up their life to create this thread in order to basically weave their house together. <laughs> it's absolutely mind boggling. And the video that I have here attached to this presentation, when you click on it, if you stay the course, you'll actually see this weaving behavior. And it's, it's truly phenomenal. Uh, crazy critters. So uh, hopefully now you've gotten just a little glimpse into why I'm terrified of ants. Um, whenever anybody asks me like which insect I fear, I don't, I try not to fear any, but I, let's say I have a healthy respect for ants. All right. So I do have to talk about termites. Termites are really interesting. They were formerly in their own order, Isoptera, um, and they have been found to be more closely related to cockroaches. So they've been moved to the order Blattidea, and this is recent. So it just goes to show you that we are constantly learning and understanding relationships between these insects, right? That 
just when I went to school to the students I teach now, I learned they were in Isoptera and now we know they're in the order Blattidea with cockroaches. I, it took me a while to accept that, but I, I accept it now. Now, one interesting thing about termites is that they are parametabolists. You might be like, what does that mean? Well, when we talked about holometabolists that we saw with ants and the order Hymenoptera and bees, where they go through this complete transformation, right? This metamorphosis where they have this pupil stage, Termites don't do that. They basically go from an egg stage to different immature instars where they look like little termites, and then they will become adult termites, right? So there's no pupa stage. The immature stage looks just like a smaller version of the adult stage. That's all parametabolism means. They don't go through true metamorphosis or true change. There's a lot of species of termites and we now know and believe they've evolved from cockroaches. So they're highly derived cockroaches you could think of. Um, many, many of them nest in the ground around our area um, and around your area. We have subterranean termites, which are really cool. Um, and one really fun thing to do if you've never done it before is to collect them. And they have a trail marking pheromone um, that someone found out the ingredient in the ink in Bic pens actually mimics their trail marking pheromone. So if you were to draw a circle on a piece of paper with a Bic pen and then collect some of these workers, they'll follow whatever you draw with that Bic pen. If it's a circle or a heart or a square, they'll follow that ink because they think they're following um, a trail left by one of their nest mates. Now, another really interesting thing about termites is that they have internal symbionts. And some people believe that eusocial organisms, this is really common, that eusocial organisms have other organisms that have co-evolved to help make them successful. And just like honeybees, but a little bit different, um, they have a type of trophallaxis. Remember, we were talking about ritual feeding trophallaxis, another kind of... Um, descriptor that's often often present in new social organisms well they actually have to re-inoculate themselves with these internal symbionts through feeding on workers excrement so every time they molt they shed the lining of their stomach and they lose these symbionts that help them to break down the wood that they feed on um, and so they need to re-inoculate themselves by feeding on the poop of their nest mates um, in order to get those symbionts back in their gut that helps them to get nutrients from their food. Very, very interesting. Now, unlike honeybees, nymphs or these immatures, okay, um, the soldier and the worker here can develop into workers or soldiers. So from the egg, they will develop either into a soldier or a worker. And you can see these morphologically are different looking. And this is based on colony needs. So pheromone levels present in the colony at the time will kind of change the physiological trajectory of these nymphal termites, which is crazy. I, I they, It just blows my mind. Um, and now the reproductives, we have a male or a king, and we also have the queen. And this is what the winged reproductives look like before they mate. Um, and so this is what uh, the swarm would look like when it goes off. It's just thousands of them with wings. And then they'll fly away, find a king or a queen, whatever, and then mate. And then the queen will go through crazy physiological transformation where she'll crawl into this kind of royal chamber where she'll lay 60 eggs per second in some species. So that makes queen honeybees look like a joke. I mean, these eggs are just like, pew, 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 and the workers are just taking them and bringing them to the nursery where other workers will then take care of these babies. So these are extremely fecund. Once she is in that royal chamber and she's physiologically changed and pumping out eggs, she couldn't leave that royal chamber if she wanted to. She wouldn't fit out of the door opening. Um, that's how much she's physiologically changed. 
All right, so we know they're super important. Here's a close-up picture of these Nazut termites where their heads of these soldiers have been modified into these like squirt guns um, that can, they can release like sticky kind of glue-like substance. Some of them can squirt acids, some species, really crazy looking. And then we have these mandibulate soldiers. This is a different species where they have these highly sclerotized and largened heads for thumping in order to sound the alarm if there is um, danger, and also these large mandible jaws for kind of attacking any intruders. Termite reproduction, again, reproductive swarm, they pair up, they cast off their wings, and they'll start a new colony together. Different from honeybees and ants is that males periodically will supply that queen with sperm. And some queens can live for 10 to 20 years, some species, so crazy. Another characteristic that is kind of unique is that they are not haplodiploid. All individuals are for diploid, uh, are diploid and come from fertilized eggs. They don't have that type of sex determination system like we see in Hymenoptera, the ants, bees, and wasps. And probably one of the most amazing things, if you've ever seen them or have watched David Attenborough talk about termite nests, these aerial nests, they're just amazing. Very elaborate ventilation, um, different chambers. They're huge. Um, and they some of them have different compartments for raising fungal gardens. Um, and the, they, they build this. The workers build this structure from soil their feces, and then saliva from glands in their head. So this is all constructed by thousands of tiny, tiny little minute insects. All right, well, I'm sorry I went a little over as I normally do. I just wanna wish all of you happy holidays. I hope you enjoyed learning or listening if you already knew about some other social insects. Um, for your party. Thank you. I'm gonna pass the mic around for whomever has questions. Hi, thank you. I really enjoyed the talk. I didn't know about the honeypot ants. I think they were amazing. Um, yes. my, question, my question is when you explain the genetic relationship between the the queen bee and the workers there we're assuming that uh, the queen made it only one drone but we know the queen makes many drones so how do uh, workers from different drone fathers relate that should be a more simple question to answer but it's not <laughs> Um, so we do know that in colonies, there are super sisters. So we know that there's workers that are going to have the same dad um, and they will rep be representative of kind of the full 0.75, right? Um, they'll, they'll be hyper related, but it also depends on how, what genes a lot of the drone dads share with the queen. So it's, it's a lot more complex and those numbers are just guides to kind of show you that there's a higher relatedness. So even amongst workers, even non-super sisters, they're gonna be more related to each other than they are to the mother or the drone dad. But there are cases like I showed you in that one picture where the biggest relatedness value is going to be between super sisters that are sharing a mother and a dad. So the only difference there is recombination that occurs, you know, during meiosis. So, so I've got a question, Debbie, it's Landy. Yeah. These, these extremely fecund termite queens. <laughs> yes. How long do they live? I mean, how long can they continue to pump out that much biomass? I th that's a great question, Landy. And there's different species. Um, certain um, ones are known, like I said, like the king will periodically re-inseminate her. So she's not limited, like, say, a honeybee queen um, by 
just, you know, that beginning mating flights and filling up of the spermatheca. Um, there is period and he'll stay in the royal chamber with her. Many of the like if you watch videos or look at pictures, um, you'll see the king in the royal chamber with her. Um, and some of these species, they've they've been able to keep these queens. They'll live as long as 20 years, certain species. That's crazy. It's nuts. And nuts. it's really sad or not sad, but interest, I guess, informative is that these queens are really prized food source in certain cultures. They're huge. They're full of fat um, and full of calories. And so this is actually makes up a, a part of certain cultures diets. And you imagine when you're eating that queen, you're killing off a very large superorganism. Wow. Jeez. Do we have more questions? Nice. Anybody? More questions? Yes, hold on, hold on. Hi, Debbie. Um, so if they do take that queen out, do they have um, backup queens, you know, at the ready? Oh, for the, um, the termites? Yeah, so that's another thing that's crazy about termites and different species behave differently, but there are certain termites that, again, their developmental trajectory is completely based on, on need, which they demonstrate through pheromones. So they're communicating, it's, it's a, an olfactory kind of morphological determination system, which is crazy. So because they're diploid, they're all diploid. They don't have that sex determination distinguishing males from females. So really any egg based on colony leads can go or needs can go in any, to any development, you know, can become a queen, can become a worker, can become a soldier. Um, and it's based on the chemical communication at the time that they're being raised. Okay, great. Thanks. Sure. One more question from Adriana. Hi. See, yes, one more question. Um, I heard that uh, in the honeybee colonies, there can be diploid males, but that the nurse bees actually kill them. Yes. Is that true? That is true. Um, they're not reproductively viable. Um, so they, they, there have been like where in, in the lab where they've been able to allow them to develop to maturity so that the workers can't kill them and they're not reproductively viable. They're a dead end. And it's a way to, um, you know, control inbreeding and for a colony to become too inbred um, so that those males cannot then go out and be part of the mating population. Um, and, you know, so that's absolutely true. Thanks, Debbie. Um, yeah. I really appreciate your taking the time to speak to us tonight. I wish we could have had you here in person, but I know. this was this was wild. <laughs> um, and uh, at some point, I'm gonna gonna get you to the side and and get you to tell me about how cockroaches are you social. Oh my a real gosh! Eye opener for me. <laughs> yep, I know, I know that it's it's crazy. I mean, and also I didn't even touch. There's some crazy um, uh, earwigs that are social. Earwigs are social? There's certain species of earwigs that are social. All earwigs actually demonstrate parental care. The mothers guard their eggs and will care for them. And literally she sits like on them, protecting them until they mature. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's-, it's Oh, it's you were gonna tell us about the naked mole rats too. Oh, yes. Well, the, the naked mole rats are just, that's like a whole nother that's a whole nother time Landon. all right we have to okay you have to come back that's all <laughs> yeah thank you we'll let you go get some sleep everybody's all right. clapping all right thanks Landy. Good night. Good night, everyone happy holidays and to you